The rest of us, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 and I'll read verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, we're looking at the second part of verse 17. And I told you we are almost come to the end of this teaching. <laughs> uh, I think it's little more than two years, just across two years since we started. We started from verse 10 to verse 17. But the thing is, is there is so much of truth in these words here, in these verses. So we have come to verse 17, the second part of verse 17. And here, in the second part of verse 17, Paul introduces us to the sixth weapon called the sword of the Spirit. And he also tells us what the sword of the Spirit is. He says, take the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, I showed you that Paul uses the Roman soldier's sword to illustrate what the sword of the Spirit is to the believer. What the sword does for the Roman soldier, the sword of the Spirit does for every believer. And I showed you that of the five different kinds of swords, you know, the Roman soldier used five kinds of swords, uh, especially in confrontation of their enemies. So of the five different kinds of swords here, the Holy Spirit carefully selects one particular sword. Uh, you know, it's translated from a Greek word called the machara, because God wants to show us what the sword of the Spirit really does for you and me. So that is why of the five different kinds of sword, there are different kinds of swords there, but the Holy Spirit chooses one word. Why? Because he wants to show us what this sword will do for the believer. And I began to show you how the Machera sword was a deadly one. It was a killer weapon. It was razor sharp on both sides. And it was not like the gladius sword. I told you the gladius sword was long, it was broad, it was very heavy, and it was only sharp on one side. You know, that was not very effective for combat. But this sword was not very long, it was not very broad. It was little short, I gave you the measurement there, but it was razor sharp. And the whole purpose of this sword is to keep the enemy far away. The enemy cannot get too close to you. That's the main purpose of this sword. It is for close combat. Unlike the gladius sword. The gladius sword was long, so you can know far, you can strike. But that will only cause not much damage like the Machera sword. This was a killer weapon. It was designed in such a way that if the enemy gets too close to you, you take that sword and you stick it into his stomach there. You'll just rip his inside out. Everything will come out. The guts, everything will come out. So the main thing of, the main purpose of this sword is not to let the enemy get too close to you. If he gets too close to you, you take this sword and you use it. Then we went to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and I showed you, Paul says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the first thing that we need to understand is the vital relationship between the spirit and the word especially we who are living in the last days should be very careful about this failure to understand the relationship between the spirit and the world will cause trouble will bring trouble will bring chaos i showed you right from the 17th century itself how people have deviated they have given importance to either one or the other and because of this from the 17th century till today they have troubled the body of christ they brought chaos and confusion within the body of Christ and it is all because of one thing only they never understood the importance between the spirit and the word they either gave too much importance to the spirit and neglected the word or they gave too much importance to the word you know mechanically they began to study the word and buy out the word and all those things and neglected the spirit I showed you both are equally fatal so you cannot leave the spirit also because it is the Holy Spirit that teaches you. It is He that helps you understand. He is your helper. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will strengthen you. He will give you wisdom and counsel. How? Through the word. Without Him, you will never understand anything about the scriptures. You will never even know what the scriptures are saying. So, you cannot neglect either. Both has to have equal importance. Then we looked at uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. And the term word 
that is mentioned there refers to the most familiar Greek word called rhema. You know, I told you there are two words used in the Greek for the scriptures. One is logos. The logos is the written word, the written scriptures. The Bible that we have in our hands today, that is called the written word, it is called logos. But in Ephesians 6.17, Paul is talking about rhema. So last week I gave you an uh, in-depth definition about rhema. I showed you what is rhema. But rhema is a particular word or scripture quickened by the Holy Spirit to the heart and mind of the believer at a specific time for a specific purpose. That is what rhema is. It is a word or scripture quickened by the Holy Spirit in the heart and the mind of the believer for a specific time and for a specific purpose. That means this doesn't happen always. I told you, if you are on a problem, if you face any crisis or you face any issue in life, you don't just go into your room and wait for the Holy Spirit to give you a word. You don't say, oh, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, I have a problem. I have a financial problem. I have a health problem. I have this problem and that problem. So please give me a rhema word so that I can overcome this problem. It's not like that. That is why I told you it is for a specific time and for a specific purpose. So usually when you have problems, what do you do? You take the word and you use it against your particular problem. If you have a financial problem, you take the scriptures about your finances and what the Bible says about your finances and you speak it. You declare it. If you have health problems, you take the scripture and you declare it. So normally when you face any problem, you don't go and wait for the Spirit of God or to hear the voice of God. God will give you some scripture. No, no, you don't do that. When you have a particular problem, you take the scripture and you use it for that appropriate problem. I'm talking about when you are on a problem and when you are confused and you are not sure about what to do and when you are uncertain because you've never even understood the problem, the reason and the cause of it, you don't have an answer for the problem. At that time I'm talking about, that is when, when the Spirit of God will quicken a word or a scripture in your spirit and in your mind. And that is what becomes Rema. See, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and he quickens the word that is in your heart and your mind, because the Holy Spirit has spoken, you are filled with assurance, you are filled with confidence that God himself has spoken and he has spoken the answer to your problem. He has given you the answer. You are confused. You never understood the problem. You didn't have an answer for your problem. But now because God himself has quickened a word and a scripture in your heart and in your mind, now you are so filled with assurance and certainty that that word that God speaks in you, you know, causes faith to rise within you and that is what becomes a Reba word. I mean, you are filled with confidence. You are filled with assurance that you will come out of this because now you have the answer and the answer is come from God's word quickened by the Holy Spirit. I gave you an example last week. I don't want to go through that. <laughs> but that is what a Rema word is. Okay, let's go further and come back to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. Now from Ephesians 6 17 we know that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. No doubt about that. Paul himself says it there. What is the sword of the spirit? It is the word. Now you need to understand that Paul here is not talking about a literal sword. I told you he's not saying, well, if the enemy comes against you, anybody comes to fight with you, put on the old armor, eh? put on your helmet, put on the breastplate and the belt and take your sword and go and fight. No, no, he's not talking about a literal sword here. When he says the sword of the spirit, he says which is the word of God. He's not talking about a literal physical sword. He's talking about a spiritual sword. See, uh, a believer needs to recognize that every battle you face is spiritual. Oftentimes people don't understand that. <laughs> Finances, you may think, well, that is not a spiritual problem. No, my friend, it is a spiritual problem. Health. You may think it is a physical problem. No, when I teach on divine healing, I'll show you. Health and sickness and disease is not a physical problem. It is a spiritual problem. See, believers don't understand that. So every problem that you and me face is a spiritual problem. And that is why God has given us spiritual weapons and a spiritual armor. 
This is not a literal armor that he's talking about. He's talking about a spiritual armor. So the sword that Paul is talking about here is not a literal sword. He's not saying take that sword and go and kill someone. No, no. He's talking about the word of God, the sword, which is the word of God. So he's talking about a spiritual sword. Now, turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we have a further revelation of the sword that the apostle Paul is talking about. This spiritual sword, what type of sword this is? Now, in the natural, I showed you the Machira sword was a killer weapon. It was razor sharp on both the sides. I even showed you a picture of it. So, what type of sword is this spiritual sword? How powerful, how strong is it? And that is what we have in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So, let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Scripture tells us here that for the word of God is living and powerful and then it says sharper than any two-edged sword I like that here we have a further description about the spiritual sword that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6 17 in 6 17 he says for the word for the sword of the spirit is the word of God he says it's the word that is the sword but when you come to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, we have further revelation, further information is given to us about the type of sword that God has placed in your hands and my hands. It's amazing and also shocking that believers don't understand what they have in their hands. <laughs> yeah. So he says here, for the word of God, what is he talking about? The word of God, that is the sword. For the word of God is sharper, it is alive, it has life in it and powerful it has life it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword in other words the word of God is far more sharper far more powerful far more deadlier than any sword including the Roman soldier sword that he used the machera including that you know that sword was a killer weapon it terrorized the enemy the moment they saw the Roman soldiers had this sword, the enemy were, you know, they were terrorized by that sword because they know what that sword could do. It will rip them apart. So they were afraid of that sword then. And when we come to God's word in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, God, the word says, the scripture says that, that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> God has placed in your hands and my hands a killer weapon, my friend. Something that is more powerful. Something that has the very life of God and it is more powerful and more sharper than any Machira sword that the Roman soldier ever possessed. That is what God has placed in your hand, in my hand here. Okay. But let us come back to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 and look at it again properly. You know, you cannot exhaust truth from the, from the scriptures. <laughs> the more you look at it, the more you keep understanding it here. So let us look at it properly. And let us see how the word of God describes uh, the, uh, what the Bible says about this sword here. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful and, and, and sharper than any two-edged sword. <laughs> A year in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, the word is described as a two-edged sword that means it is it has life it is powerful what is he talking about he's talking about the word of god and it is a two-edged sword it is sharper than any two-edged sword that means it has two edges and it is sharper than any two-edged sword that is what hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says but let me show you properly the phrase that is used here in Hebrews chapter 4, 12 and other parts of scripture all through the New Testament is taken from the Greek word and you know it is made up of two words it is made of the uh, which is one of the oddest Greek words in the whole New Testament see the, there are many Greek words in the New Testament the whole New Testament was written in Greek and the Old Testament was written in Hebrew the original text there and this word is the oddest Greek word 
in the entire New Testament. I'll show you why this word is very odd. When we understand the meaning of it, then you will know why this word is so hard. So it is made up of two words. One is, the first word is the word die, di, or di. It means two. And the second Greek word is tomas, which is the word that is used for one's mouth. So di means two. Stomas means one's mouth. When you put both these words together, when you compound, uh, compound both these words together and put it together, it forms a new word called distomas or distomas. And you know what it means? It's referring to, or it means, two-mouthed. Two-mouthed. So that is how you have to read Hebrews 4.12. In the original Greek text, that is how it is translated. You can go and check it. In the Greek, they have translated it as two mouths or two mouthed. Everywhere in the New Testament, wherever this word two ages comes, it is translated as two mouthed. That is why I told you it is a very odd word. <laughs> now, you know, in the English language, we have a phrase where we say two faced. <laughs> eh? You're a two faced person, we say. That is okay, we understand that. But here it says two-mouthed. So Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-mouthed sword. That's how literally you should understand it. It's a very odd picture, isn't it? I mean two-mouthed, two-edged sword we understand. But in the original text, it's not translated as two-edged sword. It is translated as two-mouthed, two-mouths. So keep this picture in mind. Every time you read, come across this verse, too aged, just remove that and substitute it with the original Greek text, too mouthed. And now let us read scriptures and see what it means here. So with this picture in mind, let's go to the book of Revelation. Turn to Revelation. Chapter 1. Verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword. I'll stop with that. Out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword. Now, you read the scripture and you tell me what does this mean? What does it mean? Is it saying that out of Jesus' mouth, out of his mouth went two sharp, literal, two-edged swords. <laughs> From his mouth, one sword, layer, one sword. Right? Is that what it means here? <laughs> that will be ridiculous, isn't it? Out of his mouth, two swords coming. But when you read it in the English, it's a little unfortunate. They didn't translate it correctly. <laughs> and remember, we know that Paul is not talking about a literal sword. Even Jesus did not use a literal sword. <laughs> Remember on the night when he was arrested? What did Peter do? He took his sword and cut off one person's ear. <laughs> and Jesus said, put your sword down. Eh? Because my kingdom is not of here. It is from there. If it is from here, then people will fight for me. I would have a, you know, army to fight for me. Eh? So even he never used a literal sword. So it's not talking about a literal sword coming out of his mouth. No, no. That's why when you read scripture, you need to understand what has been said here. So substitute that word now, two-edged sword, and put two mouth there, and then read it. So this is how Revelation 1.16 should be read. And that is how it is in the original Greek here. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-mouthed sword. Now it makes a little sense. <laughs> That's how Revelation 1.16 is translated. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-mouthed sword. Now some of you are wondering, what is this two-mouthed? <laughs> that is why I told you this Greek word is one of the oddest Greek words in the entire New Testament. It's a very odd word, two-mouthed. But I'll show you why they translated it as two-mouthed. Why this odd translation? But before that, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Let's come down to Revelation chapter 2. Verse 12. 
I'll read it first as it is in the Bible. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. <laughs> Again you have the word two-edged sword. But just remove that phrase two-edged sword and insert two-mouthed there. <laughs> And this is how Revelation 2.12 Revelation 2 could be translated. A sharp sword with two mouths. A sharp sword with two mouths. That is how it should be translated there literally. And it is in the Greek there. Now the question is this. Why does the original Greek text says that the word of God is two mouthed? You will find again and again in the original text. This is how they have translated it. This, this is how it is written in the original. Every time it talks about the word of God, it talks about it as two mountains. So the question is, why does the original Greek translate this phrase as two mountains? Diastromas, why is it translated as two mountains? A very odd translation. So why this translation? Why this unique word in the New Testament here? Well, there's a reason. The Holy Spirit will never do anything without a reason and a purpose. There is a definite reason and a purpose and that is why the Spirit of God carefully selects this particular word and uses this word even though it may be strange and it may be odd but he chooses this word because he wants to show us and teach us something about this word. Why it is so hard and why it is so special. Okay, so let me tell you why it is translated. Now, one sharpened edge of this sword came into being when the word of God initially was spoken out of the mouth of God. Now you need to listen carefully. If you miss this, you'll miss everything. <laughs> you remember the, the gladius sword? I told you it was long, it was broad, it was heavy. But the problem with that sword, why it was not effective for combat and warfare? It, the Roman soldiers even actually were defeated one time using that sword. And the reason is this, because it was sharp only on one side, the other side was blunt. So when you use that sword, you have to be accurate. You, may, you must be sure that you hit the enemy or the opponent with the sharp side and not the blunt side. If you hit him on the blunt side, you will not kill him, you will just hurt him or injure him. And it's very difficult to use such a long sword and a heavy sword and to pay great attention and care to hit the enemy with the sharp side. <laughs> that is why one time when they used it, they were defeated and from that time they never used it again after that. They just left it aside. So the word of God, that means when God initially spoke his word, when the word of God or the scripture came out of the mouth of God, at that time it was sharpened on one side. You getting it? That means when God spoke it, it came out of his mouth. It was on only a one mouth word, a one mouth scripture. <laughs> because it came out only from his mouth. It was like the sword that was only sharp on one side. Yes, it was the word of God because he was the one who spoke it. It came out of him. He was the one who spoke it. But even though it was the word of God and he spoke it and it was powerful and it was alive and it was sharp. But the thing is, it was only sharp on one edge. You get it? When God spoke it, it was sharp. It was a sword. It was sharp, but it was sharp only on one edge. One side was sharp. Then you may be asking, what about the other edge? I'll tell you. The second age is added to the word of God when you take it and when you speak it with your mouth. That is when the second edge is sharpened. That is when it becomes razor sharp. It becomes a two-edged sword. It becomes a killer weapon in your hands. That is why in the original text it is translated as two-mouthed. Are you getting it? See, first God has spoken. He breathed the scriptures. Scriptures came from him. The origin of scriptures, I showed you it's not man. Man did not sit down and write the scriptures. No, no, they didn't think about it. The scriptures were breathed out of God. It came from him. That is why it has his life. It has his being. Everything is there in the scriptures. All that he is, he put in his word. 
The word and him are same, one. That is why he says, if you love me, you will keep my word. You'll abide with my word. You cannot say you love Jesus, but leave his word. <laughs> it's called the words of Christ. Why? Because Christ and his word cannot be separated. They are both one. Colossians Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Why does he say the words of Christ? He could have said, let the word dwell in you. No, he, he's making a point there. He's trying to show us something. He's trying to teach us something. He says the words of Christ. In other words, he's saying, these words came out from God. They came out from Christ. So you cannot say, I love God. I love Jesus. And don't leave his word and neglect his word. <laughs> no, no. If you love Jesus, you will love his word. If you love the word, you will love Jesus. They're both one. So when God first spoke the word, scriptures, one edge was sharpened. <laughs> It was like a sword but with one edge but when you and me take the word and when you speak it with your mouth that is the time a second edge is being added to it it becomes razor sharp it becomes a double-edged sword it becomes a killer weapon in your hands in my hands now we are coming here to a very important principle <laughs> I'm going to show you something very important that is why this word is an odd word and that is why you will find it is translated as two-mouthed. So as far as this you get it. God spoke it. One side was sharpened. But when you and me take the word, the written word, the logos, and when we speak it, then the second side becomes sharpened. That's when it becomes a two-edged sword. It becomes a killer weapon in our hands. Now, this is the principle. See, in the natural realm, even though the Roman soldier had one of the most deadliest weapons, the deadliest sword called the Machira sword, it was razor sharp and it was designed to rip the enemy apart. But even though they had such a powerful deadly weapon, now my question is this, can that sword by itself do anything? Hello? Yes, you have a deadly weapon. You have the best sword, a deadliest sword. But my question is this, can that sword by itself do anything? Can it go and fight battles? <laughs> Hello? Let's say the enemy is coming. He's coming to attack you. Will the sword go by itself and attack the enemy? No. So in the natural, you may have the most deadliest sword, the most sharpest double-edged sword. You may have the most deadliest weapon, but you need to understand by itself, it cannot do anything. Nothing it can do. Even though it's a killer weapon and a deadly weapon, but by itself, it can do nothing. But that same sword, when it is placed in the hands of a swordsman, especially a person who is skilled, you know what happens? It does wonders for him. It becomes a deadly and a killer weapon for him. Are you listening? <laughs> that same sword, by itself it can do nothing, helpless. But when that sword is placed in the hands of a skilled swordsman, then that sword will do wonders. He will do wonders with that. Hello, and that is placed in a person who knows how to use it. I tell you, it becomes a deadly weapon. It becomes a terror to the enemy. You may be wondering what I'm trying to tell. Well, I told you, the spiritual and the natural are always similar sometimes. Just like how in the physical realm you may have the deadliest weapon, the best weapon that can kill any enemy. You may have it, but by itself it is useless. You can't do anything with that. Unless someone knows how to use it, there must be a good swordsman. He should be a person who know how to use sword. He should have had sword practice. <laughs> Just because the enemy is coming, you cannot take a soldier. Well, come on, you take this sword and go fight him. No, no. If he has the best sword, the most deadliest sword, and if you give it to him, but if he has not done sword practice, if he has not practiced with the sword already, then I tell you, he cannot do anything with that. In fact, the enemy will take that sword and kill him only. <laughs> 
He may have a deadly weapon, a sharp two-edged sword, but because he is not skilled, he does not know how to use it, it will become fatal to him only. He's not used it before. He's not used to fighting with a sword. And when war breaks, how can you suddenly give him a sword? You can give it to him. But the thing is, it will not help him. <laughs> he will never be able to do anything with it. Because he has never had sword practice. <laughs> He's never used it before. He's not used to it. He's not fought with it. Now when war breaks out, how can you suddenly give him and tell him to do something? So, the physical and the spiritual are similar. In, in the spiritual, it's the same. I'm going to say something, it may shock some of you. But it's the same, just like this. In the spiritual, even though we have the word of God, the written word here, the Logos, the Bible, in your hands and my hands, even though we have it, but by itself, listen carefully, don't quote me wrong, outside everything is recorded here. Even though we have the word of God, we have the Bible here, by itself, it can do nothing for you, my friend. Are you listening? You have the word of God, we have the scriptures, but by itself, can it do anything for you? It cannot do anything for you. Some of you are confused now, you are looking at me. <laughs> Can the Bible bless you by itself without you do anything about it? See, some people have a vague idea about the Christian life. They think, you know, God will just bless them any over and everywhere. Blessings will come upon me automatically. I wish it was so. <laughs> Blessings don't come upon you automatically, my friend. The promises of God don't come upon you automatically. Hello? Thousands of promises are there, more than that. Does it come upon you automatically? Hello? Yes? Some of you are wondering, some of you are saying yes. <laughs> if the promises of God comes upon you automatically, then I tell you, every Christian person will be free of all sickness and disease and he will be blessed in every aspect, even including financial prosperity. I mean, every one of us should be well, isn't it? If whatever God has spoken in his word, if it comes upon you and me automatically, that we should all be blessed in our spirit, in our soul, in our body. We should be blessed in finances. We should all be on top and never down. No, no. All these things don't come upon you automatically. And that is what I'm saying. The Bible or the scripture by itself can do nothing. It cannot change you by itself. It cannot transform you. It cannot bring the blessings of Calvary upon you. It cannot bring the blessings of the new covenant upon you. It cannot transform you. It cannot make you the person that you need to be automatically by itself. That is why many Christian people they have Bibles in their hands there and still live in defeat and failure and lack and want and sickness and disease. Why? Because they think it will come automatically upon them. <laughs> they think if they simply have a Bible that God will bless them and something good will happen. And that is why you will find people having big Bibles. <laughs> Everywhere they go, they'll carry it. When they sleep, they'll put it under the pillow. <laughs> why? Because they think it will do something for them. It will guard them. It will protect them from all he will arm and danger from all the devils. <laughs> Just like the sword by itself cannot do anything. If the enemy is coming, the sword cannot go and attack the enemy. No, no. The sword has to be placed into the hands of a swordsman. And he should be a skilled person. He should have had sword practice before. Then he takes it and then it becomes a deadly weapon in his hands. Because he's skilled, he's practiced, he knows how to use the sword. And when such a person has a sword, it becomes a killer weapon. And I tell you my friend, it is the same with the scriptures also. Same with the Bible also. The Bible by itself can do nothing for you and me, can do nothing for anyone. 
And that is why, as believers, you and me have a vital task to do. We have something very important to do. What do we need to do? We need to take the word of God and put it into our heart and put it into our mind. Hello? Are you listening? Don't just buy our Bible and keep it on a shelf. A lot of people have different Bibles. You'll see in some houses, a lot of Bibles will be there. So don't buy a Bible and keep it on the shelf or don't keep it under your pillow. No, no. What you need to do? You need to meditate upon the word of God. You need to take the words that are in the Bible, the scripture that is in the Bible. You need to fill your heart and fill your mind with the scriptures. I mean the scriptures should invade your heart and your mind should be full of the scriptures, full of the word of God. And when the heart and the mind is filled with the scriptures, you know what? Those scriptures, when it rises from your spirit and flows through your mouth, then it becomes a double-edged sword. That means when the heart is full of the scriptures and the mind is filled with scriptures, it is invaded with the scriptures. Now you are soaked with the scriptures. I mean you are so full of the scriptures that the scriptures will arise from your spirit and it will come out of your mouth. And when it comes out of your mouth, that is the time the scripture becomes a double-edged sword. That is the time it, has, it takes on the second age. When you take the word and when you speak it, that is the time the second age is added unto it and it becomes far more deadlier than any or sharper than any two-edged sword in this whole universe. That is the time it becomes a double-edged sword, my friend. Are you listening? <laughs> that is why it is called two-mouthed sword, not two-edged. <laughs> why two-mouthed? First God spoke it. But that's not enough. Is it the word of God? Yet it is the word of God. Does it have power? Yes, it has power. It is alive and powerful, but that, that is not enough. It will not do anything for you. And that is why I say, even though God's word is almighty and all powerful, and even though it was spoken by his mouth, it is still the word of God and all those things. But even though it had create power, create a power, power to create, power to destroy, power to heal, power to give life. It has. The word of God has all those things. I don't deny that. Nobody can deny that. It has the power to create and destroy. It has the power to move mountains. It has the power to heal. It has the power to raise people from the dead. Give life to the dead. It has the power. But by itself, it can do nothing. <laughs> But the same word, when it is filled in your heart, when you take it and fill it, fill your heart and fill your mind with these words, and then when you speak it, that is the time the second edge is added. That is the time it becomes a double-edged sword. It becomes a two-mouthed sword. Double-edged sword means two-mouthed. So it's not enough for God to speak scriptures. You need to take the scriptures and you need to speak it. When you speak it, then it becomes sharper than any other two-edged sword. Are you listening? So you have a task to do. <laughs> See, some people think that God will do everything. Even if they have problems, they think, God will take care of the problems. No, my friend, he was already taken care of it 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. And that is why meditation is so important. Meditating upon the word of God. Reading the scriptures daily, taking the word of God, putting it in your heart and putting it in your mind. See, when the heart is filled with scripture, it's a principle. Jesus himself says, when your heart is filled with scripture, then what happens? Whatever is in the heart will outflow, come out through your mouth. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs> Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means, what is on the inside of you will come out, how? Through your mouth. So I tell people, talk less. <laughs> you know why? Because the more you keep talking, it's like you reveal who you are. Every word shows you what you have on the inside. Every word that you speak reflects what is on the inside. It's like this. It's like a CT scan. <laughs> 
you know when you are sick and they're not able to find the real fault you know somewhere something is wrong on the inside and the ordinary scans cannot show what is the problem they'll tell you to take a CT scan why because that will show what is on the inside in the same manner when you speak that will show what is on the inside see I don't know what is in the inside of you I'm not God <laughs> and I don't want to play God I cannot play God but when you speak by your words, I can tell what is on the inside of you. <laughs> no, sometimes people come with problems. And I tell them, well, have faith in God, believe in his word, take the promises. And you know what they tell me? That is what I'm doing, Pastor. <laughs> One hour they just spoke about the problems. So what does it tell me? It tells me what is on the inside of you. You're just filled with fear. You're filled with worry and anxiety and that is exactly what is coming out. See, it's a principle. It cannot be changed. Whatever is on the inside of you will come out of your mouth. So if the scripture is on the inside of you, if you have faith in God's word, if you really believe God's word, then even in the midst of problems, even when you're in the midst of a storm, you will not be shaken. You will be firm there and you will speak God's word. You will degree God's word. You will not talk about your problems to every Tom Dick and Harry. <laughs> People say, I have faith, I believe in God. But they will go everywhere and tell everybody about the problem. <laughs> You know, sometimes I feel sad for believers, for Christian people. They don't know what they have with them. They don't understand the deadly weapon that God has placed in their hands. Can you just imagine? They have such a deadly weapon that is able to destroy the enemy and rip the enemy apart. But because of their ignorance, they don't know the power of the word. They don't know that this is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a killer weapon. They don't know if they just take the word and put it in their heart and put it in their mind. Then when they face problems, they can just speak the word. And this word will destroy the enemy's works against them. They don't know that. They have the sword. And when they face problems, they go to everyone giving the head. Please pray for me. <laughs> Why? Because they don't know what they have in, hand, in their hands. They don't know what God has placed there in their hands. That is what is called a rhema word. <laughs> when you take the word every day and when you put it in your heart and put it in your mind there, your heart and your mind is filled with the word. Now when you face a problem and when you face a crisis and you are confused, you don't know the solution because you never understood the problem, so you don't have a solution. At that time, the Spirit of God will quicken a word or a scripture and when that word or scripture is quickened in your heart, because God himself is speaking to you through his Spirit and you know for sure that this word comes from God. It is from God. A thousand people may say a thousand things about your problem. But you know God has spoken to you and he has spoken the answer because it's from the word. He speaks, he has spoken to you through the word, through the scripture. And because he has spoken, this word or this scripture will cause faith to rise within you and you will speak it out. And the moment it cleaves your mouth, another hedge is added onto this sword and it becomes a killer weapon and it destroys and rips apart the enemy's work against you, my friend. That is when it becomes a double-edged sword. And that is why I said, the word of God by itself can do nothing for you. You know, some people when they dedicate their house, before they could put their leg, they'll put the Bible in the house. <laughs> Sometimes Christian people can be weird, strange people. <laughs> They just think before they could put their foot there, if they put the Bible there in their home, they'll think everything is well. I know some preachers, you know sometimes people will say, well you know there's some demon spirits in my house, someone has done some witchcraft, some copper plate is somewhere there, so please come and pray. And you know what they will do? They will bring the Bible and they will take the Bible and they'll go everywhere. They'll put the Bible in every room. Either they are sprinkling water or they are putting the Bible. 
When I went to pray for one person, I prayed for him there. He's saying, Pastor, please go on top also. Take the Bible there and put the Bible there. <laughs> Are you listening, my friend? The word by itself can do nothing for you. You can have the Bible in your hand. You can carry it wherever you go. You can put it under your pillow. You put it on top of the pillow. You put it under you. You put it on top of you. Do whatever you want. It will do nothing for you, my friend. It will not change you. It will not transform you. It will not infuse power into you. It will not give you victory. It will not bring success to you. It will do nothing for you. That is why it is called a two-mouthed sword. Why? Because God has given us the scriptures for what? To take it and put it in our heart and put it in our mind. This is not some New Testament teaching. This is an Old Testament teaching, my friend. This is what God taught in the nation of Israel. So that they will never forget who God is. They said, write these scriptures, put these things on a signboard, put it in your house, put it on the doorpost, hang it everywhere. Why? And tell it to your children so that they will remember it and never forget it. It will get into their hearts and minds so that when they go into a crisis, they will take this word and they will speak it this word that is in the hearts will arise within them and it will go forth out of the mouth and it will become a killer weapon it, God taught them in the Old Testament itself today we have people hanging these verses on the doors <laughs> everywhere in the house but when a problem comes what they do they run to the pastor and give the head <laughs> are you listening I'm not against hanging verses in your house, my friend, but what is the purpose of that? It's not to show that you're a Christian. <laughs> no, no, the purpose is that why God told them is so that these scriptures will get into the heart and get into the mind. They'll be filled with it. They will never forget it. They will always remember it. That is why he says, let it be before your eyes always. That means read it, understand it, and keep bringing it back to memory. Let the heart and the mind be filled with it. Why? Because when you face a problem, then the Spirit of God will quicken this scripture within you. And this scripture will arise from your spirit. And when you speak it from your mouth, it will destroy the enemy's works against you. But if this is empty, <laughs> and this is empty, no word inside, then how can the Holy Spirit help you? He is your helper. Remember, he will not fight your battles. <laughs> you can't tell him, Holy Spirit, go and fight for me. No, no. <laughs> he has equipped you and given you everything. He is your helper. He will only help you to fight your battles. He will not do it. You know, in our country, it's very famous. When a helper comes, we dump everything upon them. In an office, when a new person joins, everybody dumps their works upon him. <laughs> He's just a <an> helper. <laughs> so we think the Holy Spirit will do everything for us. No, my friend, he's your helper. You got to do it. He will give you whatever is needed. You want counsel? You want, you, you want, what is it? You want guidance? So if your heart is empty and the mind is empty, if there's no scripture in there, then how can the Spirit of God help you or quicken a word or a scripture that is in your heart there? And how can the word arise from your spirit? And how can you speak it if there's nothing in your heart and mind? No wonder believers are defeated. <laughs> because when the enemy comes, there's nothing in for the Spirit of God to quicken. He will bring to remembrance. That means when you read it, even if you forget it, then he will help you remember it. You don't do anything about it. He can't do nothing. Well, I'll just stay with this. Next week we'll continue. I think probably next week will be our last week on this subject and we may start a new topic. But remember this. The word of God by itself can do nothing for you. You want healing? Don't just keep the Bible in your hand. No, no. You want finances? Don't just keep the Bible in your hand. No, no. You have to go to the scriptures. Take those scriptures. Put it in your heart. Put it in your mind. And then when your heart and your mind is filled with the scriptures of health and healing and blessing and prosperity, it will arise. Whatever is within you will come through your mouth. Abundance of the heart will come out through your mouth. Whatever comes through your mouth, that is what you are filled with. So that is why you need to take an inventory of yourself. You need to check yourself. What is coming out of your mouth? <laughs> then you know whether scripture is there or not there. Especially when you are in times of a crisis. What do you speak? 
do you speak your problems or do you speak the word of god whatever is inside that is what will come on the outside of you through your mouth so take time to fill your heart and your mind with the scriptures and then when you speak it from your spirit it becomes a double edged sword a two mouthed sword it's a killer weapon against the enemy see you the devil is terrified by a person who knows how to use the word of god if you are a skilled swordsman and i tell you the devil will come never come near you he will keep only at a distance no why because he knows that you are a swordsman you've been practicing sword practice and you can take the sword and you can wield it against him and destroy him so that is why he will keep a distance he will never come too close he will maintain a distance because he knows if he comes too close you are going to destroy him because you are skilled you know how to take the sword and you know how to wield it against him so you have some work to do what you need to do you need to do some sword practice <laughs> hello <laughs> it's not enough to come to church some people think if i go to church every sunday everything will be well no my friend <laughs> you come to church thank god you listen to some good messages <laughs> he builds you up but that's not enough you need to do some sword practice every day see the thing is this you may have a deadly weapon but when the enemy comes if you are not practiced with the sword if you are not done some sword practice you cannot take that sword and go fight the enemy because you don't know how to use it you are unskilled in that spiritual also it's same if you don't do sword practice if you don't start putting the word in your heart and your mind and you start don't start speaking it you won't have any sword practice then when the enemy comes you cannot do anything you don't know how to use the sword there and that is why every day you need to keep practicing with the sword take the word put it in your heart put it in your mind and speak it that is what meditation is about it is about speaking and declaring and decreeing the word of god that is when it becomes a two mouthed sword or double edged sword that is a deadly weapon in the hands of any person and the enemy is terrorized by such a person he is terrorized to such a person he will never get near he will maintain a distance <laughs> well i'll stay with this next week we'll continue shall we stand